and thanks to everyone for attending and participating in this, I think, really great symposium. And, and again, I think it's great to, to be getting together in person again. Uh, one thing uh, to, uh, that I would just want to highlight before I start is, you know, with Dr. Shatter's point about that post dilatation, I think is really critical. You're really trying to remodel this plaque, make it so it's less, uh, has less embolic potential. Uh, and you do that, and if there's a 20% residual stenosis, completely agree, that's that's not going to be a significant embolic risk. And there's very, very low restenosis rates. Uh, with that being said, let's talk about endarterectomy. This is my disclosure. So uh, to, to Dr. Shatra's point, uh, you know, the, what we're treating here is, is sort of unique in, in vascular beds in that we're treating embolic potential and not an absolute reduction in flow across the stenosis. Uh, because that's that's in nine, greater than ninety percent of, of strokes that are associated with with cryostenosis, it's from an embolic event. Uh, for endarterectomy, and, and we were talking about remodeling plaque, doing angioplasty, and stenting. Right, you, you're resolving the stenosis, but you're really remodeling that plaque and tacking it down in the sort of interim until it remodels with the stent. Well, the, the way we, we eliminate the embolic source in, in endarterectomy is to take it out. And you can see with this, uh, this plaque, with the multiple ulcerations and the aggregates of platelets and sort of chronic thrombus deposition, how it could, could potentially lead to an embolic event and a stroke. Um, you know, endarterectomy has been studied uh, very, very extensively uh, and, uh, through many decades in randomized prospective trials. And again, this is not unusual for the coronary literature, but in the peripheral vascular literature, quite unusual. And the only real circumstance in which it's been done, the NASA trial uh, confirmed uh, a, a remarkable threefold reduction in stroke risk uh, for endarterectomy in symptomatic patients. The European uh, carotid surgery uh, trial, again, in symptomatic patients, threefold reduction. The VA symptomatic trial. But in uh, asymptomatic patients, we also see uh, statistically significant reductions, meaningful reductions uh, in asymptomatic patients in these randomized prospective trials comparing endarterectomy to medical therapy. Uh, the controversy that exists is, um, you know, we have newer techniques and they certainly have some, uh, some significant advantages. Uh, we, we've just uh, learned about several of those. Uh, Transcarotid stenting also seems to have some potential advantages in, in, in management. So, What's the role, uh, Dr. Prakash asks us, what's the role for endarterectomy uh, now with these newer uh, techniques and therapies? Well, just to highlight, I think for symptomatic patients, uh, there's, there's clearly an ongoing role for, uh, for endarterectomy, uh, but in asymptomatic patients, uh, is, it, is it meaningful? And, and what, to what should we be comparing it? Uh, stenting, transcarotid stenting, med best medical therapy? If you look at that ACAS trial that, that we mentioned briefly, uh, it was a landmark trial, and it showed a benefit for uh, a significant benefit uh, with a relative risk reduction of 53% for endarterectomy compared to medical therapy. But that's a very old study, right? That was enrolling in, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, these results don't apply any longer. But there are more recent trials that have been uh, carried out. The ACST, the uh, asymptomatic carotid surgery trial, has been completed. That enrollment was more recent, although still uh, dated back to, to uh, some decades. Uh, and if you look at the results, again, a highly statistically significant improvement for uh, intervention with endarterectomy as compared to best medical therapy. Uh, it was seen in all subgroups within the trial. Uh, men did better, but women also did better, uh, which is sometimes not, the, the, the benefit's not as large for women with endarterectomy. Uh, younger patients did better uh, with endarterectomy than medical therapy, uh, but older patients also did better uh, in this group. High-grade stenosis, asymptomatic high-grade stenosis, and again, speaking to the point of how do you select asymptomatic patients, what's the, we, we use the degree of stenosis as a surrogate for embolic risk, but it's certainly not uh, as precise as, as we would hope for. High-grade stenosis did better, but so did low-grade stenosis, or lower-grade stenosis, less than 80%. Uh, so, uh, you know, those are great results. But hasn't medical therapy continued to evolve since 2003? And uh, Dr. Naylor in, in England and others have sort of looked at this. This is just a plot of time versus the medical arm of these randomized trials. And you can see as we've gone along uh, and medical therapy, and attributable, obviously, we think to, to improvements in medical therapy, right? These patients are just getting best medical therapy at the time. And so by the time you get to 2009 or 2010, the, the stroke risk for medical therapy alone is quite, uh, quite reduced. Well, let's look at this ACST trial and look at the, 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 the utilization of best medical therapy in these trials. Uh, 
first of all, the, the even with uh, the utilization of best medical therapy within that trial, they still see a benefit for, for endarterectomy, for intervention. And you actually see, as these patients were being enrolled, the utilization of these best medical therapies, even within the trial itself, in terms of the uh, management of, of hypertension, uh, the antiplatelet uh, agents being utilized, uh, and most particularly uh, statin use um, was used in 82% in of patients in the medical arm, but in 80% uh, in the uh, surgical arm. So again, these patients really were receiving best medical therapy. Um, if we look at the treatments, the surgical treatments, and, and this applies to interventional treatments as well with stenting and transcarotid stenting, we've seen a pretty dramatic reduction in stroke risk in the periprocedural period. And you, we can attribute that to a certain extent of better patient selection, a better overall management of the patients, uh, evolution of techniques uh, for, for trans uh, femoral and transcarotid stenting. There's been an improvement uh, in, our tech, in our technologies that are being utilized. But in endarterectomy, we've seen a pretty dramatic decrease in the periprocedural uh, stroke rate in these population-based studies. And we've seen it also in, in, in randomized trials, such as the CREST trial. If you look at the results for endarterectomy, they've become much more favorable. And we think that uh, can be attributable in the main to improvements in medical therapy. They're better hypertension, uh, any uh, platelet, and uh, 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 any cholesterol or cholesterol lowering medications, particularly the statins, seem to reduce the risk of stroke during the periprocedural period for endarterectomy as well. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, stenting treatments uh, and compare it to endarterectomy, again, as was highlighted before, you'll see in the aggregate endpoint of uh, major adverse events at 30 days, including uh, all strokes, all deaths, and a myocardial infarction, and then ipsilateral stroke after four years, it's really equivalent, equivalent results between angioplasty and stenting and endarterectomy, I think as everyone is well familiar. But the breakdown uh, 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 that the, is within these two uh, treatment arms uh, is di distinct in that there's a higher MI rate, rate for the endarterectomy uh, and a higher stroke rate uh, for angioplasty and stenting. So again, just a sort of uh, a discussion of where the role for endarterectomy is compared to these newer technologies. Um, if you looked at the breakdown in these uh, patient results by age, sort of surprisingly, what we found was uh, the younger the patient was, the better they did with angioplasty and stenting. And then the older patients sort of counterintuitively actually did better uh, with endarterectomy. And the, the, the breakpoints were 79 years and 48 years in terms of statistical significance, but it was a continuous trend th through the whole trial. So again, in our older patients, uh, it really seems that endarterectomy may be, at least at this point, until some of these newer technologies uh, have been more fully developed, uh, may, may do better with, or do better with endarterectomy as compared to angioplasty and stenting, for example. And again, if you look at all the randomized perspective trials that compare stenting to endarterectomy, uh, there's a preponderance of uh, superior outcomes for endarterectomy as compared to uh, angioplasty and stenting. I'd point out that the majority of these trials uh, are in symptomatic patients. Uh, so that's certainly a consideration. Uh, but again, most of them show a benefit for endarterectomy as compared to standing. And in aggregate, it's a, a clear statistical benefit uh, in these symptomatic patient populations. Uh, what about uh, endarterectomy in the in the era of uh, transcarotid stenting? I think what we've seen, at least to this point, is uh, when uh, the, the increased utilization of transcarotid stenting has sort of come uh, in patients who would otherwise have been treated with uh, endarterectomy. The endarterectomy numbers seem to be uh, in areas where, where uh, transcarotid stenting is using, uh, carotid endarterectomy numbers seem to be diminishing as the transcarotid stenting numbers go up, not so much for the transfemoral stenting and whether that's, you know, patient risk factors that are uh, anatomic or uh, or uh, physiologic in nature is uncertain, but 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 certainly the the if you look at the the data for transcarotid stenting, it's pretty decent. Um, it's this is they don't have a great deal of data. They have no randomized uh, perspective data, unlike uh, stenting and and endarterectomy, which have been compared directly and are now being compared to medical therapy. Uh, but but again, their their overall uh, major complication rate of stroke death and myocardial infarction was three point seven percent in their uh, pivotal trial. So cer certainly something that uh, can be pursued, warrants further pursuit in terms of its its uh, utilization. So when we wrote these recommendations for uh, it, intervention for carotid disease, uh, we had 
not all the current data available to us, but a, a fair amount, and this may be updated uh, at some point. Uh, for the SVS recommendations, uh, for symptomatic carotid stenosis, we recommended over 50% should be, if you had a greater than 50% symptomatic stenosis, you would be treated with endarterectomy. Uh, for asymptomatic, greater than 60%, and again, this is based on NASIT, ACAS, and the other subsequent trials. For angioplasty and stenting, uh, we said we should consider for symptomatic patients who are less than 70 years old, again, based on the, the, the CREST trial data. And again, this is subject to, to um, updating as the additional data become available. Uh, the American Heart Association has very similar uh, recommendations for, for endarterectomy. They recommend greater than 50% if it's documented by angiography or greater than 70% if documented by non-invasive means. For asymptomatic, greater than 70% stenosis, they recommend endarterectomy. The AHA does uh, recommend uh, angioplasty and stenting as an alternative uh, to endarterectomy. Uh, as long as you can do it with acceptable outcomes, in other words, minimizing those major adverse events to less than 6%. Uh, and the European Society for Vascular Surgery has a similar sort of recommendation pattern with the uh, greater than 70 or greater than 50% uh, for endarterectomy in symptomatic patients, greater than 70% in asymptomatic patients. Uh, they do recommend uh, angioplasty and stenting if it's part of a clinical trial uh, or a registry trial, or again, in patients who have uh, high risk factors for standard surgery. Uh, who, who can be monitored appropriately. So those are sort of the societal uh, recommendations regarding the three types of, of intervention. Uh, the final thing that we might want to just point out uh, as far as like wh what's the role for endarterectomy in the current management of uh, extracranial carotid disease is that uh, uh, it's the only one CMS really seems to want to pay for. Uh, so that sort of is a real world limitation on, on how we manage these patients because obviously our hospitals are not going to allow us to uh, treat the patients without any reimbursement for that whole hospital admission. Uh, so that right now, CMS is limiting, uh, as you know, the, the potential for reimbursement to symptomatic patients greater than 70% stenosis who are high risk for standard surgery. So that's sort of the almost the bottom line, if you will, on, on what our treatment uh, alternatives are going to be. Clearly, there are, are patients in whom, uh, you know, alternative treatments are going to be sort of absolutely necessary. This patient had a mandibulectomy, bilateral, rad bilateral radical neck dissection, bilateral cervical irradiation, and has a high-grade carotid stenosis. And obviously, we treated her with angioplasty and stenting and not with, with endarterectomy. She can't really undergo an endarterectomy for anatomic reasons. Uh, Restenotic lesions do exceedingly well with Angioplasty and stenting, they have very low embolic potential, uh, but they don't respond favorably to endarterectomy with a high cranial nerve injury rate uh, and, a, and, a, and a more challenging uh, endarterectomy procedure itself. Uh, this can be treated quite effectively, as, as we've seen many times uh, with, with angioplasty and stenting, occasionally even using a, a cutting balloon to get that fibrotic restenotic lesion opened up. And then we have, uh, you know, the concomitant, the existence of concomitant uh, coronary artery disease and other Severe uh, medical comorbidities is quite high in patients with carotid uh, artery stenosis, uh, and we all have had many, many patients who have these severe comorbidities. And so, angioplasty and stenting really offers a much more favorable approach uh, for these high-risk surgical patients. Uh, other sort of manifestations of a hostile neck. This isn't, uh, I think, strictly doesn't meet the strict definitions of a hostile neck, but it's certainly no treat to do an endarterectomy on a patient with this body habitus. But he also happened to have a contralateral. A carotid occlusion. Uh, and so the data suggests that th there are more adverse outcomes for endarterectomy when the contralateral occlusion is present. If you use a filter with carotid stenting for embolic protection, uh, they seem to do quite well. And there's no uh, uh, decrease in, in effectiveness for, for angioplasty and stenting in that patient group. So just to conclude, current level one evidence uh, indicates that uh, endarterectomy remains optimal treatment uh, for reducing stroke in these patients uh, in those that are standard risk for for, for surgery. The overall guidelines are similar between the uh, groups SVS, the American Heart, and the European uh, Society for Vascular Surgery, uh, and in most circumstances do actually favor endarterectomy over angioplasty and stenting, and again, that's because of this preponderance in the randomized level one uh, data. And then circumstances uh, such as unfavorable anatomy or compromised physiology may justify angioplasty and standing or TCAR. However, the level of evidence uh, right now, as far as what the society's consideration is, the level of evidence is not sufficient to uh, allow us to make a strong recommendation in those areas.
the final thing I would just uh, conclude with uh, is that you know these te techniques and technologies and approaches are really complementary, uh, and and our program and I would encourage everyone to have a collaborative program as as Prakash and I have been able to establish uh, with all our colleagues, uh, Dr. Dangus and others. Uh, and that is, you know, some patients are going to do better with endarterectomy. Some patients are going to do better with uh, angioplasty and stenting. And you really want to put your heads together and make a determination on an individual uh, patient basis because these are really um, complementary uh, techniques and shouldn't be seen as, as one or the other. I mean, uh, you know, make the best decision for each patient uh, in, their, in their overall management. So with that, I'll conclude and, and say thank you again for this opportunity. Yes, I have a question. I think, uh, thank you for the great lectures. Um, just a question to about both you, Dr. Sachar and Dr. Dang is, um, you know, in, in, with, with the new, newer technology, like, like, uh, Dr. Sachar presented, um, uh, upgoing, uh, with, uh, minimizing the amount of exchanges and the, and the manipulation that we might have to do in the carotid, um, and the, uh, the great results of the Roadster, uh, trial. Do you think there's going to be an algorithmic approach to who gets transfemoral and who gets transcervical carotid stenting? And, and do you ever foresee uh, some sort of consensus coming out, maybe in a multidisciplinary manner, which could assist all of us who do these procedures to pick the uh, right, uh, you know, uh, approach for, the, for each patient? Go ahead. So, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, can we get along is a question. Uh, um, you know, I, I love the approach you have over here where you work together. We've got the same thing. We look at uh, carotids together where there's a, a, a question about what we should do and a very good relationship with the vascular surgeons, uh, between the vascular surgeons and the cardiologists. Uh, but that's not always the case. So in a perfect world, yes, I think that would be the case. I think what we're going to probably end up with is hopefully really good results with a, a, three different types of uh, revascularization, endarectomy, TCAR, and transfemoral or transradial. Whether or not we have um, a, a tavern like approach where there's going to be uh, every patient's going to go before a committee or at least two different doctors and then decide from there what to do, I think the logistics of that will probably be difficult, as nice as it sounds. But as long as we get to the point where the outcomes are going to be good uh, and people choose the right procedures, I think that's uh, probably where we'll end up, uh, my thought. Yeah, I, I think this is a very important in being able, in the end of the day, to look at the entire group's uh, complication rates and what you achieved and take pride in that, as opposed to look into each one group, uh, a number of cases, let's say. And uh, just to introduce another aspect of the complication situations in carotid standing is all the complex valve patients that now uh, undergo uh, preoperative evaluation and some of them are operable for uh, whatever uh, bypass uh, or uh, valve operation. And some others are inoperable. And they go for TAVR or CLIPS on this and that. And then we have all this complex situation on top of patients who are really inoperable. A and then, you know, you have another situation that uh, you have to also evaluate with your team. And uh, in all honesty, we, to, to, I will have to say in our own environment, uh, we have a lot of discussions, a lot of delays sometimes into making the decision. Uh, there's a vascular team approach. And uh, I, quite frankly, I, I don't remember the last time we had a significant complication there. So, you know, in other ways, you say, sure, whatever, we do fewer uh, this way, we we'll fewer the other way, we defer some of them, we do a... Uh, the valve first and some others or whichever way. And at the end of the day, we have great results. And then you look at the incredible cases we go through. And I'm like, I can't believe we're going through all of those uh, with great results. And I think that's how you have to view it. Uh, than uh, than a, a territorial aspect is just, you're just going to miss those. The, the only thing I would add is that the, I think the data are going to demonstrate that in sort of a, a majority of patients, 50, 60%, they're going to be good candidates for any of the three approaches or two of the three approaches. And it's going to be uh, patients in a, in a minority who can only be treated with endarterectomy or can only be treated with or would be more favorably treated with endarterectomy or, or angioplasty and stenting. I mean, when we look at the, these dense rocks of calcium on angio when we're, when we're looking at the, the carotid patients, uh, we know that those are going to be challenging from a, for a a transfemoral or transradial stent, and, and we refer them for, for endarterectomy. And by the same token, patients who have other, you know, medical conditions or anatomic conditions, I mean, they're clearly more favorably treated with transfemoral stenting. So 
So I think there's going to be a, a big body of patients that can be treated favorably with either or any of the three techniques. And then there'll be these sort of uh, more patients on the margin, particularly as the, as the technologies continue to evolve. These patients sort of on the margin who are going to need one or the other treatment. And I think we see that with, you know, uh, cancer surgery and tumor board, and it may be the case for, for valve uh, replacement as well. One more question. I think it's very important for the for all of us. Um, Dr. Mehran presented incredible data, and she talked about polyvascular d disease. So does polyvascular disease means carotid disease if you have concomitant carotid and coronary disease without uh, PAD? So that's my question. And I think it's going to be important for all of us to understand how we treat this. Or do we interpret that, that trial and put, do that for carotid disease as well? Well, that, that's an interesting aspect. And yeah, sure. In general, the three levels of disease. One is a, a peripheral vascular disease, uh, the coronary disease, and the carotid and cerebrovascular disease. And of course, there's another level of disease sometimes, the autoiliac disease that might not really have peripheral vascular disease. So, uh, and every time you add a territory, you essentially sort of double the long term, if you want, cardiovascular mortality or MACE or whichever of those, like from a, a very aerial point of view. So, of course, you're really going to go for an intense medical therapy and something that also Dr. Ferris implied that many older studies may be a little obsolete is because med one of the aspects is not only the stents, the surgeries, this, and also the medical therapy is very different now. We know so much more than uh, upfront high-dose statins, combination with a Zetamide, PCSK9 inhibitor. Then we know the Plavix situation, Clopidogrel. Um, we had a landmark study of superiority with aspirin 20 years ago, and now we fully understand what this really means these days. And then we'll go on top of that on some kind of combination with anticoagulant at low dose. Well, why not? Uh, the, more, the benefit you're going to uh, see is if you maximize the ischemic risk. Uh, so if you maximize the ischemic risk, as I said, it's pretty obvious. So the, the, the Malta territory, they just have doubling by every territory, they have a doubling of the events. So if you want to go to a population that's going to be event rich, you got to go to the Malta territory patient. Uh, and there you have them more to gain. And of course, then you're going to have to develop through clinical trials. What's the trade-off and what's the bleeding risk? But at least if you go to a population they have a lot to gain, uh, you're probably going to have more chances for a favorable uh, 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 risk, uh, uh, risk benefit ratio. Because we know the bleeding is kind of a prolonged, steady problem. Uh, and sometimes it has nothing much to do with, uh, with everything else. And uh, therefore, if you move to the higher risks of these patients, you have greater chances for a favorable uh, ratio and things to work. The only thing I would, I would add to that, I completely agree with all of that, is, uh, but I, um, the correlation between coronary disease and peripheral vascular disease is pretty strong. But I think, uh, if I remember correctly, if somebody has coronary disease, the likelihood of having coronary disease is about 10%, so it's not as strong. So I think if somebody's got coronary disease and, and uh, PVD or iliac, moving towards a rivaroxaban based strategy, I think makes all the sense in the world as we're understanding more about the thrombotic risk. Uh, expanding that currently to carotids as well, uh, broadly, I think maybe a little bit early because then you increase the risk of potential cerebrovascular bleeds. Um, but I think it definitely needs to be looked at. Some of those data in terms of 10% are, I think are old. I remember them from fellowship. But I think more, more needs to be done uh, before we start doing that. I'm saying doctor, yeah. a, a true stenosis of the carotid, you have three of us yeah. probably get to zero. Yeah, I think you know if you end up revascularizing and you're on uh, DAPT for a month, then you take one of them off, either aspirin or plavix, and add on rivaroxaban after that. I think that probably starts to make sense at that point.